in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Bonus scoop time. Zolgad, uh, executive producer Declan Goff, as always at the control of the ship, and uh, the man who brings us the scoops, our friend Darren Doogie Wolfson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News and Scoop Fame right here on Score North. And uh, Doogie, let's start with Vikings and Adam Thielen. What are we uh, hearing so far about his sprained ankle? You know, obviously the Vikings play on Thursday against Pittsburgh, which is a quick turnaround. But what is the timetable for Thielen to possibly return? Good morning, gentlemen. Judd, I am told it is a significant ankle sprain. That being said, like he's pushing right now to find a way to get on the field on Thursday night. He is one tough dude. Now, I think the doctors will get involved, and and I don't see him playing on Thursday. I would say December 20th to be determined. But based on the severity of the sprain, I do think December 20th would be even a bit aggressive. I don't think this is a season-ending type injury, but I can tell you I am led to believe from multiple angles this is a very significant ankle sprain. High ankle sprain, correct, which is which is the, the worst of the uh, potential ankle sprains that one can suffer. Yeah, and I mean, there's different grades on these sprains. You know, it's just it's not good. It's not good at all. You know, we know that Dalvin Cook isn't playing on Thursday. You know, I was chasing an update on Christian Derrissaw. I have a hard time believing that he'll be good to go short week. They are going to get guys back on defense. We had dinner last night. I told you even, you know, late in the week last week that there was a sense like if Sunday was a playoff game, let's say it was January 15th, January 16th, Vikings at Packers. First mm-hmm. round, NFC playoffs, that Eric Kendricks would have found a way. So I anticipate Kendricks back on Thursday. I anticipate Anthony Barr back on Thursday. But we've discussed there's some chronic issues going on there. Like he's not yeah. going to be anywhere close to 100% the rest of the way. But he can gut it out. He has been gutting it out at times. So I anticipate Barr being back. But certainly Kendricks and Patrick Peterson has been activated off the COVID list. I am told COVID did not beat him up at all, so he is good to go. It was a matter of just producing multiple negative tests. He has. He has been activated. He'll be good to go on Thursday. What are you hearing scoop-wise, to, uh, especially after a loss to the previously winless Lions, Doogie, uh, about possible changes here? Because I got to believe that what we saw on Sunday – if the Wolves didn't have confirmation that changes were were necessary at coach and possibly GM, losing to the Lions <laughs> probably hammers that point home. What is uh, the speculation right now about uh, potential changes the Wolves might make, most likely after the season? Yeah, I don't anticipate anything in season. Now, if Thursday goes completely haywire. I guess would I be shocked if we woke up Friday morning with some news? I guess I wouldn't be overly shocked, but I'm with you, Judd. I think it comes after the season. I think Mike Zimmer has earned that opportunity to see the season through. Then if you need to make the determination on Monday morning, January 10th, or if they somehow sneak into the playoffs as the seven seed, lose that first round, you make a decision on Monday, January 17th, so be it. But I think Zimmer, in my sense, is like – Because there were times earlier this season where people thought, okay, like, is it coming? You know, is it going to be a Black Monday at TCO Performance Center? I've never gotten the sense they were going to pull the trigger in season. So even if they lose on Thursday, I still think Mike Zimmer is probably this team's head coach on Friday. But, yeah, Judd, I mean, change seems inevitable. I think it was inevitable after Cooper Rush, you know, led the Cowboys down the field on Halloween night, did what he did. But certainly hammered home when Jared Goff did what he did on Sunday. Heck, Sam Darnold. I know they won the game in Charlotte in mid-October, but let's not forget Sam Darnold. Nondescript Mm -hmm. Sam Darnold led Carolina back in that game. So when you think about Darnold, Rush, Goff having the success they've had, when you look at the Vikings' defense being ranked number 30, When you think about them not being over 500 since the 2019 season. Judd, we've talked about this a lot, but I get it. The audience is ever-changing. There's some people that maybe haven't grasped 
this yet. But mm-hmm. like, think about the trajectory of this franchise if they don't win that New Orleans playoff game, right? Like so much changed after they won that playoff game January of 2020, then got destroyed the following weekend in Santa Clara against the 49ers. But if they had lost that game, and remember, they went run, run, run late in regulation when they probably should have passed the ball. They give Drew Brees the ball back. You know, the game eventually gets tied. Vikings win in overtime. But if they had lost that game, you know, I just I don't think they would have gone with status quo. So really, that win then led to 2020 never being over 500 here in 2021. Hard to see them getting over 500, even if they win the next two, which maybe they should. Like, you should beat the Steelers short week. You really should with the guys they'll have back. Now, if Pittsburgh wins, I won't be shocked. I'm sure it'll be another close game, right? Come down to the final four minutes or two minutes. But, like, the Vikings can win on Thursday. They probably should win on Monday Night Football December 20th. But even then, you're 7-7 seven and seven with the Rams coming to town. I don't like right. their chances there. Then you have the trip to Green Bay. So it's just it's hard to see them over 500 at any point this year. But I'm telling you, like, you want to hammer something home? That win over the Saints January of 2020 changed so much. And the only guy uh, now in retrospect who saw it clearly was Stefan Diggs, who said, I still won out. Like, he was the one guy who saw the trend – uh, that we all sort of saw, but then said, well, they beat the Saints in the playoff game, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but Diggs is the one guy who said, no, this isn't going to improve. And, and, and I mean, Diggs, Diggs, I don't have a ton of respect for the way he did it, uh, and he definitely became a malcontent, but he also had his reasoning, Doogie. And, and it was interesting that if you go back now to the time period that you're discussing, that he is the one guy who basically held firm and said, no, this is still on the wrong track. Nice win, lots of fun, but I need to get out. And so it, it's, but here's my, here's my question too. What's your opinion or what are you hearing uh, beyond the coach that goes to the GM as well, Dukes, because I, I really feel very strongly right now, and it's been a developing feeling, but I'm to the point now where I think you probably need to hit a big reset button um, that this team has taken its 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 punches. It, it's done, you know, it's done a, a nice job. This doesn't need to be a contentious good, goodbye. But I don't know that I, I trust Rick to find my next coach or quarterback. I think that there's a really good case to be made, as scary as this would be for the Wilfs, that this might be the ideal time to clean house and and start anew with not only a new coach, but a new GM to pick that coach as well. Well, in terms of buzz, Judd, like I'm not hearing as much on the GM side as I am on the coaching side. That being said, what you just described makes a ton of sense that these two, Rick and Mike, need to be a package deal. And especially if you're going to give Mike the rest of the year, then make a determination on Mike's future on January 10th, or if they get into the playoffs, January 16th or 17th, depending if they play that Saturday or Sunday first round. But presumably they're not winning a playoff game. They're not going on the road as a seven seed, winning at the two seed Buccaneers or Packers. So you're making a determination sometime in mid-January that if you give Mike the rest of the year, and I'm telling you, he has earned that right, at least in my opinion, to see this thing through. I agree. Like, I think at that point, that's when you pull the plug on both. Now, if they did somehow make a move on Friday morning, if they lose on Thursday night, I think that would probably, this is a little bit more speculation, but probably you know, maybe put Rick in a little bit more favorable stance, you know, in the will size that if Rick is able to then, you know, help with the transition to presumably in that case, Andre Patterson being the interim head coach, that if Rick can navigate those waters over the rest of the regular season, that maybe Rick could hold on. But I'm telling you, I think it's, it's a package deal type situation, but I'm just telling you, Judd, for me, like I'm not hearing as much buzz. Maybe I need to dig further because I know you've heard some of that buzz. I just have not heard as much GM buzz as I have on the coaching side. So to to go back to the game, uh, the loss to Detroit in particular, there's, there's one thing I feel like when it comes to Mike, because he had to approve this, that we're not discussing enough. 
the defense melted down so badly that, that, you know, clearly that's become a focus. And yes, they were missing a bunch of guys, but they're also playing Detroit, which is like, they didn't look well coached, but I feel like that's causing us to gloss over one of the most curious decisions. I think that has been made in Zimmer's coaching time here. And that is having the left tackle out. And instead of putting the backup left tackle in who I'm not a big fan, fan of but they trust him to start five games Darren um they juggle three-fifths of the offensive line with a quarterback who needs stability they move a center who had played pretty doggone well uh, they move him to guard they bring in a center and Garrett Bradbury who they benched back in and then they shift a struggling poor kid right guard to left tackle which is a really big ask um What's your take there? Because I, I really think that since Mike got here in 2014, that's one of the more baffling decisions made for a team that could have just put Rashad Hill at left tackle. I agree. Like, I go back to week two. Remember Chandler Jones, week one, had all those sacks? Rashad Hill was okay week two against Chandler Jones. Yeah, he had some issues week one in Cincinnati, but Rashad Hill is a capable backup. I'm with you. That was incredibly baffling. Now what will you do on Thursday against that Steelers front led by Watt, who, heck, you can make a case. He needs to be in the mix for MVP, that there is no clear-cut offensive MVP, that Watt of the Steelers, with what he's been doing, has to at least be in the conversation. And, like, you're really going to keep rolling with this offensive line? Now, I'm telling you, I don't have a great update on Darisaw. So maybe he makes some sort of, you know, miraculous recovery. I was told it is not a long-term injury. I heard that last week. So, like, Darisaw is going to be back at some point. But the injury report on Monday, which was more a presumption, right? It was more, you know, if we had practiced today, they didn't really do anything yesterday. But he was listed as DNP. We'll certainly learn more later today on Darisaw, but I'm just telling you, it's hard to see short week, him all of a sudden being back. But, like, it doesn't make sense. Now, I don't think all of a sudden they're going to then change it up heading into Thursday. Like, I think what we saw on Sunday is what we'll see now on Thursday night. But I'm with you. Incredibly baffling. We also saw some time management issues. The Vikings' last drive, you know, snapping the ball at one point with 12 seconds left on the play clock. That's been an ongoing issue, and it's not like Zim is is alone in that regard. A lot of coaches struggle with with time management, but we saw that rear its ugly head once again. Plus, I thought end of the first half, you know, you're facing a third and 10. You remember that play call? That was a bit baffling. You know, why not try to gain a few yards, give Greg Joseph a chance to kick a field goal? You know, once it was fourth and 10, I actually wasn't necessarily bothered by them going for it there. But I think that was one of the plays where Udo got beat pretty badly, right? He had a couple penalties on Sunday. Yeah, to move your struggling right guard to left tackle. And I get it. He was drafted as a tackle. Right. But to move the guy that's been focusing on on the right guard position to left tackle, like I, I don't get it, Judd. You're right. And I think that one, because of the way the game unfolded, with all the baffling things that happened, I'm not saying it was forgotten, but it was buried and probably shouldn't have been because that was a really, really odd decision. Absolutely. Timberwolves, what are you uh, he- hearing about a club that got beat up pretty bad by the Hawks, but what it was without D'Lo last night and Beverly still out? He should be back soon, correct? He should be back soon, yeah. I recorded a new Scoop podcast on Saturday, late morning, early afternoon. You know, I had alluded to that Beverly should be back, you know, certainly this week. I wasn't positive he'd be back Monday, so I wasn't overly surprised sure. that he didn't play Monday against the Hawks. But, yeah, I mean, I can see him back as soon as tomorrow, Wednesday, against Utah. Now, on Saturday, I wasn't aware of D'Angelo Russell, you know, having another ankle issue, you know. And so I'm not sure where where his status stands heading into this Wednesday game, you know, against Utah as the Wolves try to end this three-game losing streak. We've realized how important Russell is. Like, they didn't play well in November against the Clippers in those games that Russell missed. They did not play well against Atlanta without Russell. He got hurt in that Orlando game. Remember how bad, how putrid the Wolves were in that fourth quarter of that Magic game at Target Center? 
So we're realizing how important he is. Now, you know, if he plays last night, Judd, you know, they're still giving up those open looks. You know, now open looks is a bit subjective, but, you know, if a shot isn't being contested, it's a pretty open look. Atlanta had 33 open looks from three-point range. I mean, that just can't happen. Now, the Wolves' identity is that of a defensive team. They've been great defensively. They stunk defensively last night. Now, they've given up a lot of three-pointers at times, right? The Clippers in one game had 21 makes. Charlotte in that loss in Charlotte, the Hornets that night made 23 three-pointers. Then last night, the Hawks make 25 three-pointers. You know, it might be, you know, just everything averaging out because even though the Wolves have been very good defensively, three-point shooting-wise, you know, if you look at the opposition's, you know, cumulative, you know, shooting percentages uh, from three, uh, you know, the Wolves have been good in that regard, but they've given up a lot of open looks. Like, they're top 10 in the NBA in open looks given up. So at some point, the averages are going to catch up to you where the opposition is going to make threes. Mm -hmm. So that was the case last night. It was pretty clear that Carl Anthony Towns, you know, not himself, you know, I mean, he was pretty open post game about, you know, gutting it out. He wanted to make sure we knew, you know, that he, you know, was was Cal Ripken Jr. like trying to fight through the tailbone, you know, bruising. But he certainly was not 100 percent. And Anthony Edwards is a roller coaster, right? He'll score 48 one point. You know, I still think yeah. he's settling for too many jump shots that he needs to attack the hoop more. You know, I mean, like he's really good one out of three games. We have to get to a point where he's really good three out of three games. So it's still a roster that needs a lot of work. It's a lot of guys shooting below their career shooting percentages outside of Cat. Like Cat's been a good shot maker. But outside of Cat, even D'Lo isn't shooting what he normally shoots, but he's been really good in, in clutch situations. But it's a lot of guys. Now Malik Beasley caught fire a little bit last night, but he's been pretty atrocious so far this year. Is it the new basketball? Who knows? You know, Russell's talked about the new basketball being a part of it. Now shooting is down across the league. But that's still an issue. Like, this is not a great shooting team. And if they're going to give up all these open looks, they're going to lose a lot of games. You know, and it's still a roster. You know, I, I know, you know, some of these wins have excited the fan base. It's still a roster that has warts. It's still a roster that I just don't see how they get over 500. Now, can they get close to 500? Sure. Can they get to 36, 37, 38, maybe even 40 wins? Yeah, I think they're capable of doing that as long as, you know, they maintain relative health. Yes. But this is not this is not a great roster. This is still a roster that needs all sorts of work. You know, trade talk will pick up next week, December 15th. More guys become trade eligible. Certainly Sachin Gupta, you know, he's not very, you know, out there, right? Like he's not doing a whole lot of interviews. You don't see him all that often. But behind the scenes, he's working it pretty good. You know, I brought up the name Miles Turner a bunch. I mean, Miles Turner has fans here, you know, so he's a guy on the Wolves radar, you know, until Ben Simmons is traded, they're going to continue to at least poke around on Ben Simmons, but there's other guys. I mean, you know, I've mentioned, you know, how league executives think Toronto is a team willing to do some stuff. Portland, you know, is stuck in middle purgatory. There's a bunch of teams looking to do some stuff. Brad Stevens in Boston, that's another team looking to do some stuff. So trade talk will certainly pick up next week then certainly closer to the trade deadline, February 10th. On uh, Ben Simmons in Philadelphia, Doogie, what's going on there? So is Daryl Morey going to hold him hostage? What is, what's exactly, because I mean, his, his name, which was, you know, prevalent throughout the summer as a possible trade chip or target uh, into the early season seems to have disappeared for, I'd say the last month or so. Yeah, it has. What do the Sixers yeah. want? What do the Sixers want there? And what are the well, like like what's it gonna take for him to be traded? Because it sure as hell doesn't seem like he's going to play there anymore. Well, agree. What's it going to take? Daryl Morey coming off the ledge of wanting, you know, three or four first round picks plus the option to swap positions, you know, other first round opportunities where you know you trade every other year. You know, then those other years, you know, swapping positions, you know, yep. I guess it would be comparable to, you know, what Milwaukee gave up for Drew Holiday. But realistically speaking, Daryl Morey is not getting that. So at some point, he's going to have to come down from his asking price. You know, somebody close to that situation told me mid-December, they're going to become more proactive. You know, but you look at Philadelphia, it's another team stuck in middle purgatory. 
Now, if they had Simmons, maybe they'd be better. But right. the Eastern Conference for the first time in a few years is deeper than the Western Conference. Like Tibbs and the Knicks are like in the 11th spot right now at 500. Like if the Wolves were in the Eastern Conference, something Glenn Taylor's tried for going back many years. A lot of Wolves fans wish the Wolves were in the Eastern Conference. This is the rare year in the last few where if the Wolves were in the Eastern Conference, their record right now would have them like in the 12th spot. You know, so the East is deeper than the West. And Philadelphia's stuck in middle purgatory in that 8, 9, 10 range, you know, hovering around 500. Now they've had, you know, situations, right? Like Joel Embiid missed three weeks because of COVID. Tobias Harris was on the COVID list. Tyrese Maxey is now out. So they haven't had their full complement of guys. So they feel like they can compete when they have their full complement. But at some point, Maury's going to have to come down from that high asking price. I still think Portland makes too much sense. Like at some point, Portland needs to do something. And I understand they have new leadership. Yeah, but, I was going to say that changed, you know, changed things. The guy's been there. You know, I mean, he was under Neil O'Shea. Yep. You know, so like put CJ McCollum on the table. Like it just it makes too much sense, Simmons for McCollum. But I get it. Maury is waiting for for Lillard. That that Portland keeps struggling. That Portland at some point needs to come to the realization that they need to hit the reset button and move Damian Lillard. I still think we'll get to a point, Judd, where we see Simmons moved by February 10th. But I'm just telling you, like behind the scenes, they haven't moved very much. So things are going to have to change in the next two months to get to that point. Yep. You know, so, so far, Maury has, has shown that he's willing to wait this thing out through the season, have it go into the summer. But I just think the way Philadelphia has been playing, that at some point he needs to come off, you know, the high asking price and get something in return. So Philadelphia yeah. with, with a finite, you know, amount of time to compete with, with Joel Embiid, because that body can break down at any moment. You need to give Joel Embiid more help. Try to make a run this season. Yeah, it's bizarre. All right, Doogie, uh, uh, flip open the scoop notebook and start cleaning it out. Give me what you got. Gophers men's basketball, Big Ten opener tomorrow night, Williams Arena against Michigan State. I am told among NBA teams that will have scouts there, the Atlanta Hawks, the Charlotte Hornets, the most intriguing pro prospect on the floor tomorrow night, Max Christie, a true freshman five-star shooting guard for the Spartans. You know, but there's some other guys to keep an eye on. Sean Sutherland did not play on Sunday. So the Gophers pretty much beat Mississippi State with like five guys. Iron you know, five, the good baby. thing that Ben's team does is they don't commit fouls. You know, so even though they don't have depth, you know, they don't have guys getting into foul trouble. Uh, but Sean Sutherland, there is optimism that he will be back as soon as tomorrow night. If he's not back tomorrow night, back for the Michigan game in Ann Arbor over the weekend, this is very much a short-term knee issue. I've been asked about Master P's son, Hersey Miller, played at Minnehaha Academy last year. He's at Tennessee State. Well, he entered the transfer portal earlier this week, so I've been asked because his younger brother, Mercy Miller, is a really good player. He's an underclassman at Minnehaha Academy. He's already committed to the University of Houston. And Calvin Sampson, he is a really, really good player. Like, he's better than his brother. But I've been asked, because the Millers are here in Minnesota, what about the Gophers having interest in Hersey Miller? I am told, no, there is not interest in Hersey Miller from the Gophers' point of view. Okay. I also wrote down, Judd, on the women's basketball front. So we got an email this morning announcing a 10 a.m. news conference at Target Center tomorrow morning a USA basketball news conference. Who will be there? Well, the leader of the USA women's basketball team, the CEO or whatever the official title is. They're announcing the new head coach. They made that clear with this press conference tomorrow morning at Target Center. We know it'll be Cheryl Reeve. Cheryl Reeve is taking over as the national USA women's basketball coach. Nice. So the end game is the 2024 Olympics that she'll coach the USA in the 2024 Olympics. But there's different qualifying tournaments, FIBA events the next couple years. So she'll have duties in 2022, 2023, then in 2024 with the next Summer Olympics. So really cool deal for Cheryl Reeve becoming the USA women's national basketball coach. Paige Beckers, who heck, she could be in that 2024 Olympic team. The former Hopkins High School star, it's a pretty significant knee injury, but it is not a season-ending knee injury for the UConn star. 
six to eight weeks. So she should be back latter part of the regular season as UConn makes its push. Remember, the final four is here in Minneapolis in April. Yeah. So Paige yeah. Beckers, the good news is this is not a season-ending injury. If rehab goes well, she should be back sometime in February. So it's what, Doogie, as far as the uh, the in, the d- damage done is what exactly? Do we know? Yeah, well, you know what? If Declan can do me a favor real quick, UConn tweeted it out. If you go to the UConn women's basketball okay. Twitter page, they tweeted out the exact diagnosis. I have it in a DM, but I can't get to it right now, Judd. I did not write it down. But gotcha, okay. It is a knee injury, and the belief is she'll be back in February. Oh. If you want Declan to grab the exact details, I'm sure he can. While he's doing that, I also wrote down that the Wolves, the Wolves continue to do a ton of scouting. I mean, as of now, they have a first round pick in June. They have three second round picks. So Zarko Durasic, who's Mm -hmm. now back with the organization, one of their senior scouts, he was at Gonzaga, Alabama over the weekend. They had a lower level scout at Tennessee, Colorado also over the weekend. Alabama, Gonzaga, there were a bunch of NBA players on the floor on Saturday night, then Tennessee has a point guard, Kennedy Chandler, who's like a late lottery pick, probably right in that sweet spot of where the Wolves will be drafting. Not that they necessarily will need a point guard, but I'm just telling you, the Wolves continue to do a ton of homework. Like the Wolves have been scouting as much as any team around. They still have their season ticket at Williams Arena, so I'm sure they will have a presence there tomorrow night. But it is interesting. You know, now maybe it's just because COVID year last year, scouting was really difficult. But, like, they're scouting as much as anybody, you know, including Sachin Gupta. So, you know, they are preparing thoroughly, heavily for the 2022 draft. It's a uh, tibial plateau fracture. Got it. Thank you, Declan. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So it's a six to eight week uh, recovery period. Judd, I'm led to believe it'll be closer to the eight. But that being said, she should be back in February. Like, six, I think, is going to be, at least from somebody close to Paige. Might be yep. a touch aggressive, you know, probably yep. closer to the eight, you know, could even be nine, but that this is not a season ending injury. So that is very, very good news because, you know, when a few of us saw her go down over the weekend, we were fearing, uh oh, is that an ACL? Is that a season ending injury? That's so thankfully, it is too. not a season ending injury. All right. That's great news. Thanks, Dukes. Hey, we'll have more scoops with uh, Phil in tow on Thursday, my man. Okay. Sounds good. And then on the twins, like, who the heck knows when the lockout will end, but they were not in on Marcus Stroman who signed right before there was an inquiry, but they never, you know, made any sort of offer on Marcus Stroman right before uh, the lockout hit. They haven't been in on any of these shortstops. Like I think a trade's coming. Maybe it's multiple trades. Maybe it's a trade after the lockout for a shortstop and a starting pitcher. I can see Michael Pineda back, but like the twins have not been in the deep water on these, on these marquee free agents. I know their name, was floated on Robbie Ray. They were not heavily in on Robbie Ray. Sure, they've planted some seeds via text message, you know, maybe right. a quick conversation. But, like, any thought that the Twins have been heavily involved on these big-name free agents, many who came off the board before the lockout ended? No, the Twins were not in on those guys. Awesome stuff, Dukes. Talk to you Thursday. Okay, see you, boys. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.